of Hey Alexa. Today I'm talking to Sue Bowles, who is a speaker, an award-winning author of This Much I Know, The Space Between. She's also a life coach, a survivor, and she owns the company My Step Ahead. Today I'm going to talk about her story and her journey with mental health, um, how she's a survivor, and as well as how she kind of came to be with her company, her book, and everything. Hi Sue, how are you? I am well. How are you doing, Alexa? Good. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Me too. I just love talking to people and like kind of getting their stories out there because we all have a story and I think it all needs to be heard. Right. I fully agree. That's, that's, that's the bottom line of what I do and why I do it. Exactly. So kind of to start, maybe go start from the beginning, kind of your journey from the beginning and we can lead up in how you became the author, the speaker and the person you are today. Sure. And I appreciate the opportunity to share. Um, I do want to give a quick trigger warning for your listeners. What I'm about to share, <coughs> excuse me, I got a little bit of cough thing going on these days. <laughs> uh, what I'm about to share has to do with sexual assault, has to do with eating disorders and depression and suicide. So if any of those issues are, can be triggers for you, please have a self-care plan in place. If you need to turn off the show, come back to it later. We fully understand and support that as well. <coughs> so having said that, kind of cough drop, sorry. Um, <laughs> when I was seven years old in first grade, a classmate enticed me into the woods after school one day and held me against my will for 45 minutes. And Bobby raped me. And not just once, twice. And uh. I didn't realize how captive that was going to make me. It ended up becoming a 15-year secret. I didn't tell anyone to my senior year of college and wow. by maybe a month or two before I graduated college. So there was a lot in between there. Trauma literally rewires your brain. Yep. So here I am at seven years old. And, you know, they call it the age of reason when you're really just starting, your brain is really starting to develop and work. And my brain didn't have a chance. It got rewired from the start. Yeah. So immediately I ended up living in protective fight or flight mode, whatever I needed to do to survive an, an, an incident and a situation life. So <clears throat> when everything happened in the woods, you know, I didn't know when it happened. This is back in the early seventies. Rape was not on the radar. It was totally safe. Kids walked to school all the time. Not an issue. The entire neighborhood walked to school. We lived three quarters of a mile from the school. It was no big deal. So no one knew to ask. And I didn't know to say anything. And, the only, and it took me a while to understand that the only person who did anything wrong that day was Bobby. Yeah. He, and, and, but it took a long time to get to that point. So here I am at seven, already having things stacked up against me. And like I said, my emotions were frozen in time. So as you get to the preteen and the teen years, obviously a very emotional time. Yeah, I was already not knowing how to deal with the emotions, not knowing how to communicate, not knowing how to let someone know if I was hurting and what I needed, what I needed to deal with that. So any time you add all that on there, <coughs> I was not doing well. I ended up, um, my brain started just interpreting things really wrong. Um, I felt like nobody cared. That was the first time I was suicidal. I was like, nobody cares. What's, my, what's Why do I live? Why, why am I here? The, uh, um, I tried to fit in. I, I was very involved in a lot of activities in high school and college, drama, basketball, theater, you know, theater and drama, same thing, yeah. choir, marching band, working a job. So <clears throat> I had a lot of stuff that I was doing because I've sent, as I go back and look at it now, and, and see myself in the mirror, I understand that that's where I felt my value was being seen because I didn't feel seen before, mm -hmm. not anybody else's fault, but because I didn't know how to say I need some attention. So right. it all came out, it all came out in some negative ways. You know how that when people start acting out. 
By the time I get to college, the overactivity went off the deep end. My senior year of college, first of all, I'm taking overload of classes all the time. You're then just I'm trying to I'm, keep busy. It's like you're trying to not have that time to think. Exactly. And I'll get to that in just a minute. I, I was taking an overload of classes. I was section editor of the school paper. I was a radio DJ. I was in a sorority. I was with a sister <laughs> of a fraternity. It gets better. My senior year of college, I did, I was homecoming chair. I did the winter formal and coordinated an 18 hour super dance for muscular dystrophy all my senior year of college while wow. taking an overload and doing everything else. I am not a poster child of a healthy college student. I'm a poster child of how not to do it. <clears throat> as I learned more and more, and a lot of it came out as I started writing my book, you learn a lot about yourself when you're writing about yourself. Yeah. And what you, said, what you just said about trying to stay busy is nails it on the head. My eating disorder developed in college. Okay. Because again, the longer you're in the freezer, the thicker the ice gets. So if my emotions were frozen in time at age seven, you add over a decade of ice. Think of something shoved into the corner of your freezer and how frost, how much frostbite is on that when you finally clean it out. Yeah. That, that was my emotions. I was frozen in time and I was shoved in the back of the freezer and it just kept getting thicker. So by the time I get to college, and I don't remember what year it was, probably junior or senior year. Um, my, I started getting uncomfortable in the dining hall. My brain, while I, I had painted the picture through all that activity, I had painted the picture that Sue had it all together. Sue was golden, didn't have a problem. Sue was the strong one. You, yeah. know, you can come to Sue with whatever you got because Sue can, <laughs> she can handle it and still do all this and get good grades and the whole deal. <clears throat> so, you know, I had all that going on. So by the time it really starts kicking in, my, I may have enjoyed another serving of food. Being hungry is a normal need of your body. It's how we are designed. Right. And my brain warped it out to be, if I go up there for more food, everyone, in quotes, is going to know that Sue has a need. And Sue can't be found out. So instead... I dumped my tray, I got out of Dodge and I snacked in my room later. That's where it started because I learned to snack to curb my hunger. Where it came up, came back, come back to your statement. What I've since learned was that if I stayed busy, I didn't have to think. And if mm -hmm. I didn't have to think, I didn't have to feel. And if I didn't have to feel, I didn't have to deal with my stuff. And I was right. fully content not dealing with my stuff. But the body keeps the score and it's going to come out in some way. So for me, it came out through my eating disorder. <clears throat> now, eating disorders are an addiction. Eating disorders have, they are a, a wide range of eating disorders. There's no look to an eating disorder. You may, there are stereotypes, but they are not accurate. They are just stereotypes. Mm -hmm. my, my eating disorder is called OSFED, stands for Other Specified Feeding and Eating Disorder. And what that means is that I don't meet all the diagnostic criterion for any other eating disorder, yet I have disordered eating. I am being unhealthy towards my body. Yeah. So had all that going on, get out of college, go to grad school, life goes on and went through a long time where I was okay. My eating was actually okay. I was out of counseling. I've been out of counseling all this time. I got out of counseling. I was doing fine. And 2005, I left, lost a very dear friend to breast cancer. 2008, I'm grieving her like it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. And my red flags for my eating disorder started coming up again. So I'm a Christian, got a hold of my pastor, and he helped connect me with a counselor who specializes in eating disorders. And I've actually been with her going on 14 years now. And um, I went and traded a minute of it for the world. Wow. But yeah, but, but even then, and when I first met her, mind you, up to this point in time, I had not dealt with the rape. Nobody knew. My right. family didn't know. So this is now 2008. It so they didn't up know in 2008? No. A, a, a couple family members, I think I let my mom know. And um, I think I let my dad know shortly thereafter. <clears throat> but no, a lot of even my siblings didn't know. So okay. I, when I, when I keep a secret, I keep a secret. Wow. So, <laughs> excuse me. So anyway, so 
I'm meeting with her and it comes out in the second session. She had, she uh, gave me homework and she had me write out a lifetime line. And it was like the second thing on there. And she looked at me and said, Sue, this is huge. Did you ever work it through with anyone? And I looked at her and said, I wouldn't know what it would look like to say I worked it through. So I guess that's your answer. But then it was another six years before we could come back to that because I had all of this stuff going on and had not dealt with things as she and I have since talked, we had to get me stronger in the present before we could go back and deal with the past. Okay. Because I had. Major trauma. If you can't at least handle your everyday. <coughs> Sorry, it like froze. Oh, okay. No You're problem. Good. <laughs> okay. So, so you, you can't go back in time to deal with things if you can't handle your present. So where things turned for me was in 2014, just seven and a half years ago. And what happened was there was a movie that came out called A Ragamuffin. It's based on the life of the late Christian musician, Rich Mullins. Uh, if any of your listeners are, are listening to Christian music, his big song was Awesome God. <coughs> so excuse me, goodness, I'm getting over a cold again. <laughs> so anyway, um, they did a movie about his life and it was a really hard watch. I did a lot of, uh, you know, I just got something in my eye, mom, you know, kind of <laughs> thing. Because, because I still had the masks on. I didn't want to be found out. And I couldn't let on that this was speaking to me because then I didn't want to deal with the follow-up questions. So I was still had the masks on. I still was playing yeah. the game. I was lying to everybody else. And worst of all, I was lying to myself. So watch the movie, watch it a number of times, got something different out of each, each time. And it wasn't until that summer that the producer and the family and friends of Rich were talking about doing a retreat to continue the, talking about the themes in the movie, one of which was masks and authentic living. Took a little wow. bit. Yeah, took a little bit till I signed on and I finally signed on. And what caused me to do that was my brother. My brother had, had been in a drunk driving accident in, two, in 2012. 2013, he was sentenced to 18 months in prison. So he was already sober a year going in. He said, I, if I hadn't been drinking, it wouldn't have happened. I take responsibility for it. Excuse me. So he got home in August of 2014. And people are like in town, well, I haven't seen you for a while. Where have you been? And he looks at him and says, in prison. And that convicted me because if anybody had a reason to hide their mm -hmm. story, to feel shame over their story and shame and guilt are two different things. Shame is not healthy, <clears throat> but if anyone had any of that cause, my brother did. And instead he's being bold and sharing his story. Yeah. That convicted me. And I was like, and I looked at my counselor when I finally signed on and said, I'm petrified and I just want to be authentic. Get me ready. We spent six weeks working through my anxiety and my fear to get me ready so I could go to this retreat. Part of this retreat, what makes it so special is that they open up a Facebook room um, a few weeks before the retreat. So everybody can get in there, start getting to know each other. The yeah. very first year, we were all total strangers. Nobody knew each other. The only thing we had in common was this movie and, and being drawn to this retreat. We were all broken in a mess is what it came down to. Yeah. So <clears throat> I get in this room and for about three or four days, I'm lurking, stalking, reading everybody else's stories, commenting, encouraging them. And then I don't, and then I finally share mine. I'm waiting all day for the negativity to this day. There has not been one negative comment. I got to that retreat, went into it, feeling to calling myself the holy exception feeling like i was uh everything in the bible was good enough good enough for everybody else but me i was too screwed up too far gone there's no way god could ever love me and i left there saying and starting to believe for the first time that jesus christ loves me and he not only loves me he likes me and he's absolutely crazy about me oh that's there's amazing big, there's a big difference between love and like Yes, very much big so. Big difference. Yeah, big time. <clears throat> so, and what did it was that these people were what I call Jesus with skin on. They just loved me. They, they gave me a safe place where I could be broken 
and not have to worry about what everybody else is thinking about me. Fast forward to 2020, 21, 20, well, 2014, even did that. 2016, we're starting to deal with the rape. We're dealing with all the emotions. Eating disorder, emotions are not your friend. So my eating disorder is kicking in again. 2016, my diet, my counselor finally, um, she gets back on me about getting a dietitian involved. Up to this point in time, I've dodged that bullet about three times over the course of few, of course of years. Mm-hmm. There was no dodging it. We, I tried yeah. about four or five weeks. It just didn't work. And I'm so glad she stuck to it because I've been in recovery now for my eating disorder since 2016. I have a Amazing. dietitian. I have a dietitian involved. <coughs> I have my counselor involved. <coughs> and now that's where that coupled with the retreat, the first year retreat, I had to own my story because I was in denial about my story. I hated my story. I was afraid I was going to cry and never stop. I cried a lot, but I stopped. The second year I had to grieve my story. I cried even more yeah. and I stopped. The third year, I left left with the nugget that I am valuable to God. And that is the turning point for me when I started, I dared to believe that I mattered, that I had something to say and that my life was worth living. When I started to believe, I'm not saying I was there, but I started to believe when that started, that's when things started to change. A year later, I started writing the book. Took some time off because I'm dealing with all the emotions. Finish up the book in 2019. The first half of the book is my story. I go into a lot of detail about a lot of things I didn't share here. Um, So, and the concept, like you talked about, this much I know, we all have our stories. It's the one thing nobody can take from us. Yes. This much I know is my story. The second half space between talks about the healing journey I went on about, you know, having to own the story, grieve the story, and then, then the different things that God continued to do to build on the fact that I, I do matter. Because go back to high school and college, I felt I didn't matter. Why am I alive? Nobody cares. And then that totally got flipped on its head when I took a risk and I let down my masks and I found a place with people where I could say, took off the mask and said, I'm scared up. And, and, and I don't know what to do. So as after the book came out, I, I started speaking before the book, I started speaking at the health class here in town uh, at the local high school. And that started the speaking. I was speaking about eating disorders. I was at least strong enough. I could speak about that. And I knew I wanted to speak. I knew I wanted to be a speaker. And so you start with what you know. And then exactly. it, it, it continued to grow from there. Then the podcast started. In two years, I've done nearly 100 podcasts. I've got a goal of 65 for 2022, and I did 10 just in January. Wow. <laughs> so, so the speaking opportunities have, have blossomed. I present, I've done a virtual presentation at a national conference twice in the last two years. I presented at a state level conference a number of times, about four years in a row. I've done some virtual stuff for a school over in New Brunswick. I've done you know, <clears throat> all kinds of stuff. But what I love most is being on the stage and speaking to people. I'm a life coach. They go hand in hand because what I get to do is, is I, <clears throat> I get to journey with people in their specific journey. Uh, so where, when, they, when they have an area of their life where they want something better for themselves, and that's what I get to come alongside them with and to help them <clears throat> as we dig into that. What is it? What is, what's going on? What don't you like? What do you want to see changed? And then we start working, working to see how they want to make that change. And the most rewarding part is when they come back the next week, they took that action step they, that they decided they wanted to do. And their confidence has just grown. There's a smile. There's a twinkle in the eye. That, I did it. <laughs> I was petrified and I did it. Yeah. And we talk about that. We celebrate that. And then we move on. And that's the whole concept between my step ahead. You only have to be a step ahead to help the person behind you. So I'm, I'm still reaching out for help to my counselor, but I can still reach back to somebody else who's go, starting the journey or, or still going through their journey that I've at least gone through. I can reach back and help while I reach out for help. And together we have a human chain of support. So that's, yeah. the, that's, that's the, the whole concept. That's what happened with the book. That's what the business is about. That's what my life coaching, my speaking is about. And, and it's just, I, it's, it's thrilling for me. 
It's absolutely thrilling. I'm so glad. And your story is truly inspiring. And like, look how far you've come. Like just a few years ago, like you had these masks, like oh, everything yeah. was fine. Everything, like nothing was wrong. And like, now look what you're doing with your story. Yeah. And that's exactly it is that all of us have a story and every story is worthy of being told. We have to get through the crap we tell ourselves. Yes. We, we talk, we are listening to ourselves. We're just not real kind to what we say about ourselves. And, and yeah. all of us, all of us need a safe place where we can take off that mask and say, you know what? Right now I'm pretty screwed up, yeah. but I'm still slugging. I'm still slugging. <coughs> exactly. And even, I think it was my counselor actually, what did she say that like kind of resonated with me was, um, I don't know. <laughs> my mind is like all over the place, but it's just, I agree. Um, but yeah, no, I agree. It's like just being one step ahead. Mm -hmm. I think we put, we, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'm, you're good. We, we put pressure on ourselves to have it all figured out. And, and, and that's, that's why I like that concept my step ahead, because you know, it came from a couple of different sources. But the idea is that you know, we put so much pressure on ourselves to feel like we have to have it all together. We have to arrive, whatever that means. And we, we can't be real, that we have to be Superman or Superwoman. I hate to tell you, but those are fictional characters. They do not mm -hmm. exist except in our imagination. It does. Yeah. It, and and I, I think people are, are screaming for authenticity. I think they're afraid of it. And I think some people just need a little extra hand to help them along so that I can help them take that next step ahead. <clears throat> I agree. I think, like you said, it is so important. And I, like my saying is that you're forever strong. Sometimes mm. we don't feel that strength, but it's deep down and we just have to dig a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And I call our, I call people that have gone through everyone that's gone through something, which everyone has warriors. I don't like the term victim. I don't right. think it's a good a good thing to say. So I like the term warrior. You know, with that, I have partnered, I'm in Ohio on the side of Columbus, and there is an organization called Healing Our Warriors. And it's an, it's a local organization, 501c3. And, but they are available to anybody, to anybody. So we've had people come in from Florida and New York, and I think the West coast and just everywhere. It's a one day event to help people who are struggling with suicidal ideation depression, stress, PTSD, anything, you know, anything like that, extreme anxiety. And, and, and it's just a one day program. It's free. It's absolutely free to give them tools to better understand where that came from and how they can start fighting. And it's called healing our warriors because we all have a warrior inside. And then I come along behind and offer a four week coaching program for any of the participants who, who, who would like, like to be involved in that. So they can take the take things they learned that day and start putting feet to them. And then, you know, and if people want to continue on from there, that's fine. I'm happy to do that. <clears throat> but it's, it's very rewarding to watch people start to know how to communicate and, and set their boundaries and set their goals and stick to them and then start realizing I can be free. I don't have to live the way I've lived the last 15 years. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming and sharing your story. I think it's an important one. And I think my listeners can really learn a lot from you. I so. would like to, we're going to switch gears a little and we're going to yep. play a, a game. Um, yes. I like to ask all my guests <coughs> these same questions and it's just fun to kind of hear all the different answers. So the first one is what's your favorite drink? Uh, my favorite drink is Dr. Pepper. Oh, Dr. Pepper is really good. And I'm uh, trying to not drink a lot of it. <laughs> I know. I know. It's good, though. Uh, what's your favorite show or movie? Uh, my favorite movie is Dead Poet Society. I love Robin Williams. He was a tremendous actor. And, and even just the whole nature behind that movie of Believing, allowing people the creativity to come out of their shell, discover who they are, is just this fits right in line with everything <laughs> I'm doing. Yes, very true. Um, what advice do you have to your younger self? Oh wow. Um, 
be bold, be bold and to do whatever you need to do for you. Find the safe people and let them help you. I love that. Um, describe yourself in five words. Wow. Enthusiastic, spirited, dedicated, compassionate, and wow, um, helpful. And what does success mean for you? That's great because I have a presentation <laughs> I do about redefining success. <clears throat> and I don't want it to be about what I do. I want it to be about the lives that I influence. Yeah. So success for me is simply doing what I do one life at a time and watching someone else get where they want to go when they didn't think they could get there. That's success to me. That's amazing. And I think that is important because a lot of people will think like success is like something, like a thing where it doesn't have to be. Mm -mm. It's not about things. It's about people. Yes. And feelings. I, and yeah. I, I, I've been overseas. And when I first came back, I, I had a real bad culture shock. And as I've gone overseas more <clears throat> to Latin America and South America, the way I describe it is that they are more joyful because they have people and not things. And we are more frustrated and depressed because we have things and not people. Not people. Yeah, very true. Um, so we're about to wrap up, but where can my audience find you? Sure. A couple of different places. Your best bet is go to my website, suebowls.com. Uh, she'll have it in the show notes. It's B-O-W-L-E-S. Um, there you'll find stuff about my coaching, speaking. If there's something I can do to help you, I offer a 15-minute free consultation. Go to that website, fill out the form. I'll be in touch with you within 24 hours. We can set something up. I'd love to talk to you, see how I can help you get where you want to go. Because that's what I do. Um, I'm also on Instagram, Facebook. Instagram is my step ahead. Facebook is my step ahead and Sue Bowles coaching. So it's, it's a little bit of just look up my step ahead, look up Sue Bowles coaching and you will find me. And then right. there's, one, there's one other website as well. I'm still being developed called mystepahead.com. That's more of an encouragement one. I'm redoing it. It only has a few blog posts on there right now, but that'll be continuing to build as well. Very cool. Well, thank you again for coming on and I hope everyone has a great day and I will talk to you guys next time. Bye. Thanks.